Okay, Chris Barker. The Internet of Things and Cars. Take it away. Hello. Thank you. I want to invite my panelists out to come on and be seated. Good afternoon. So I'm Chris Barker. I'm a senior vice president at Wagner Edstrom Communications, and I lead the automotive and connected car team uh, within our agency. And I'm uh, delighted to be here today and have the opportunity to uh, chat with some very smart gentlemen on the topic of the Internet of Things and Cars. Uh, and what I would like to do is have each of our panelists uh, take a moment to introduce themselves. And then uh, also uh, we're going to ask that each of you take a moment and in your points of view define what is the Internet of Things, what does that mean to each of you? And then where does the connected car fit into that equation? So I'll start with Joel. Joel Hoffman, I'm with Intel, Intel Corporation. I am uh, part of the automotive division of Intel. And that division is, is nestled right inside of what is called now the Internet of Things division, or Internet of Things group. It's actually broken out on our financials now. So we definitely take Internet of Things seriously. We're investing a lot in that space, a lot of people, a lot of money, uh, a lot of opportunity that comes, that previously might have been referred to as the embedded group. So that's why there's a, a nice crossover there. So I'd say what, what, what's important or what the Internet of Things means to me is it's an opportunity to get the whole industry to work together. And when I say the whole industry, I'm not limiting it to the tech industry working together, but the tech industry working with other industries such as transportation, the infrastructure, the cars. They used to speak all different words. At the least, we've gotten to the point where we have a marketing agreement on the term Internet of Things. So it's really going to be how well we can select the various standards that make up that ability to communicate from, you know, all the way from your pocket, through your car, to the cloud, and, and back to the infrastructure. So. Emmanuel. Emmanuel Brown. I'm the Director of Design Strategy at Citizen. We are a technology innovation consultancy based out of Portland, Oregon, uh, that typically works in very complex, heterogeneous environments such as the carrier space, automotive space, healthcare space, et cetera. So for us, the Internet of Things is about that hyperconnectivity that Joel was referencing, that the layering of data connections uh, through service architectures hardware uh, architectures and others that enable greater fluidity of service across my personal devices, my professional environments, and just my greater context as a person. The car is the first instantiation of the Internet of Things in the sense that you've got heavy industrial architecture uh, and coming together with what you consider to be a consumerization of IT model. Uh, at the same time, there's disruptive data around all of those models that is creating some challenges for the industry and making, uh, again, to Joel's point, everybody having to figure out new ways to work together uh, in order to materialize the value that's innately in there. Andres. Good afternoon. My name is Andreas May. I'm director of Smart Connected Vehicles at Cisco. And uh, for us at Cisco, it is um, actually the internet of everything, as we coin it. And uh, it has four major components in our view to make uh, innovation happen uh, that we see all around us. Number one, it's about connecting things, connecting cars, but also connecting cars with traffic lights, with parking spots, with all the things it needs to connect to to create uh, better experiences for all of us. The second element is connecting data. So you need to connect pools of knowledge, let's say about uh, how good the driver is in the car, uh, how operational the vehicle is uh, that you're actually driving in, uh, how dangerous the road stretch is that you're driving on. And if you combine these pools of knowledge, you can suddenly create a more safer or a safer uh, driving experience. The third element is connecting processes. So it's really about um, uh, not only looking at the driving experience, but combining it with other day-to-day -day, uh, um, processes uh, that make our lives easier. In the last element, it's, uh, it's about connecting people um, that can then uh, potentially share a vehicle or share information about what's going on uh, on the roads. And that's the four elements that make the Internet of Everything. And it, uh, from the examples, we believe that the connected car is really at the core of making this a reality for all of us. 
Good afternoon. My name is Niall Berkeley, responsible for business development at Telenav. Uh, we are a provider of connected navigation services to the mobile and the auto industry. Uh, so for me, kind of the notion of the Internet of Things, basically just I, I think of it as anything that benefits from being connected will be ultimately connected. And uh, I, I do believe the car being connected, there is great benefits. I mean, you think of just safety and infotainment, the obvious ones. But uh, traditionally, the, the car, I mean, there's a lot of data being processed on a car. Most of that traditionally has been done on board. But now as we're able to move data back and forth, it really can be a game changer. I mean, a game changer to how cars are ultimately built and also, I mean, how consumers e experience those cars. Tim. Hello, my name is Tim Nixon. I'm the CTO of GM's Global Connected Consumer Organization, which is uh, a department within General Motors focused just on connectivity. Um, it embraces OnStar and uh, connected devices and infotainment uh, inside the company for all of our brands globally. Um, Internet of Things uh, is an interesting term. We were uh, talking a little bit earlier, uh, some of us here, about what does that term really mean? Well, for us, when I think of Internet of Things, um, we recognize and look around all of, the, all of the individual things that are beginning to get connected, whether it's thermostats or wearable devices um, or appliances or whatever, whatever it might be that's in your life. All of that's starting to kind of fuse together into this digital life uh, that people are you know, enjoying and, and leveraging every day. In the world of cars, in, in my world, uh, specifically in the connected side of cars, we recognize people want to bring that digital life into the car. It doesn't end uh, when you walk out into your driveway or in your garage or wherever your car is parked. You want to bring that with you. And one of the things that we really emphasize when we think about how we engineer our products and think about what we want to really enable for customers is let them bring that digital life into their vehicle. And in turn, we want to bring their vehicle back into their digital life. Uh, and that's something that's really enabled when you put connectivity into the vehicle and actually embed it and let it fuse into the vehicle, uh, much the way uh, it's fusing into these other devices. So uh, that's kind of my summary uh, statement around what that really means to me and what we're, what we're doing about it. I wonder if I could add a, a comment to my comments since I was the first one. Um, I, I really like the way Tim put that in that the um, digital lifestyle is really what's driving this concept of the Internet of Things. And maybe I didn't hear it completely from my colleagues here, but um, I don't consider the car to be a thing on the Internet of Things. The car is not a thing. It is a system of systems of things. Because when we get into the cars, we bring our personal lives, digital or otherwise, into the car. Uh, that's what's made the car business such a passionate thing for so many followers, that their personal experience is living through that car. And of course, now we have all kinds of digital devices. I wear a Fitbit. That's got information about me. All that information is now being fused together. So I think that the opportunity for the car business and for the tech providers that are represented here is to find the right ways to fuse that information together. And a car is a great platform because you do spend an awful lot of time in the car. Uh, maybe not in New York City if you're using public transportation a lot, but uh, even public transportation is going to be part of that Internet of Things. That brings up a good point. So as the car is more connected and gets progressively more connected as you move forward, how does that change the driving experience? How does it change the traffic management experience? of how people navigate around cities as congested as New York or perhaps even less congested. And I know, Tim, maybe if you have initial thoughts since you're with the company that's working on these things. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to answer, and I'm sure my colleagues here will have much more to say about it as well. Um, when I think of connectivity in a vehicle, you, again, I'll just go back to the statement that we've been, in some respects as an industry, connecting cars for a while, but we've been doing it in um, in ways that have been, I would say, somewhat partial in terms of what the, what the total solution could ultimately be. Uh, when I think about OnStar, for example, we've had 18 years of safety, security, peace of mind. Uh, but it's been primarily a human touch, voice-centric service. There's, there's certainly been data, and we've continued to build data into it over time. But now when you think about connectivity, the way uh, it's emerging with 4G LTE and built-in always-on connection that's tied to the vehicle, tied to the vehicle systems, 
Um, it knows where the vehicle is. Uh, it, can, it can sense what you want to do and where you want to go. Now you can start to fuse that with information that's in the cloud. You've got the pipe. You've got the bandwidth and the throughput. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got a low latency connection. Um, and when you think about the transformation that's happened to phones, um, we, we went through a major transformation in this past decade, right? Everything changed when the smartphone came along. Um, and applications were born, and third parties started bringing their enablers to a platform that, for the most part, uh, was enabled because APIs were brought to life. Um, so I, I think when it comes to the vehicle uh, environment, um, I don't know what that next killer app's gonna be. I, I, I can't frankly predict it, and I wouldn't expect uh, a lot of folks on my team personally to be able to do it, but if we enable others to be able to bring those to life, um, much the way some of these other devices have done, I think we, have, we will have done our job. We've got to do that in a responsible way. Uh, we've got to do it in a way that really is allowing scalability and flexibility because once we put a platform out, we don't have the luxury of an 18 or 24 month turn. It's going to be in a customer's hands for a long time, and we want to make that as useful as possible for the entire life cycle. I really like the way you framed uh, the question because I think it's not necessarily about creating new apps, it's about creating or uh, delivering new experiences. And experiences in three different uh, ways. Number one, the ownership experience, which is dear to uh, uh, companies like uh, General Motors, because you suddenly can identify issues earlier that are kind of uh, creating malfunctions in a car. Um, so you reduce the detection to resolution cycle. You can also reach your customers more directly. <coughs> you can do over-the-air updates that keep the software of the vehicle up to date. So that's the kind of ownership experience that is, uh, is uh, transformed. On the driving experience, uh, it's getting a little bit further away from the core business of the automotive uh, company, because here uh, you need to connect to traffic lights, you need to connect to parking spots and to the external uh, life uh, or external environment. Um, to create better driving experiences, you have better throughput through uh, crossings, you know, the eternal green light zone is one example, um, or congestion abatement is another one. Uh, and the third one is really the mobility experience, where you will eventually see a convergence between personal transportation and public transportation and shared transportation, and all of this is enabled through connectivity. And uh, the more you move towards the last element, the, the further away it is from the traditional core business of an automotive manufacturer. So the call is out, who is going to create these experiences eventually? You bring up a good point about how much innovation has been happening at the, in the car itself by manufacturers, OEMs. Now it seems like the conversation is shifting to the infrastructure and how do these advanced vehicles now plug into often antiquated traffic systems that we operate in the United States. In your opinion, what's the next phase of how the connected car needs to then be realized as we move toward an autonomous car? Uh, what is the infrastructure play here? and What has to happen uh, to make that more of a reality, to, to catch up with the innovation that's happening on the, in the vehicle side? I'll take that one. I sure. think um, the thing that we're starting to see is a broader push towards standards adopting certain standards, whether it's inside the vehicle telematics and understanding that the codes that are being generated from those telematics have to work on some level cross-platform, mm -hmm. much like you've had in the PC industry and other industries. You, you have to establish the standards in order to enable those platforming to happen uh, and then ultimately grow past that. So for, you know, in Europe, you've got consortiums building around uh, these kinds of things where multiple OEMs are going in to try and find those standards, work together on those standards and then make sure those are communicated and adopted in a way that different municipalities in different countries can enable them fluidly and be prepared for the connected car. Now the funny thing is we can prepare a little bit advanced, but down the road even further, it's really gonna be a system update ritual that we're gonna be going through. So whatever architecture is put in place to drive that standardization, it's got to be flexible enough to be updated as well as the car technology is going to be updated, as well as the systems in the cloud are going to be updated because those things are going to all be interlinked. Mm -hmm. So that level of standardization is, um, is critical to moving forward in my mind. The interesting result from, uh, one of the interesting results from the test, uh, tests that were done in Michigan was that just by way of vehicle to vehicle communication, you can address about 80% I think of the use cases uh, to prevent crashes. And so there is no ultimate need for this type of safety-related use cases for infrastructure. 
So the infrastructure is just, I would say, the icing on the cake. So if you have achieved the safety through vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, then you can move on to the next stage where you uh, create these eternal uh, green light zones uh, for traffic lights or uh, connect with uh, parking spots, etc. So we should not uh, overestimate the relevance or necessity for infrastructure. Good job. I think it's uh, common <clears throat> in these connected car discussions that we have to dwell a lot on the connections, the performance or the type of connections that are made. I, th I think that's actually, those decisions have largely been made. They're getting better all the time. As Tim pointed out, the new technologies going to the car, you know, the latest cellular technology, not a, not a year or two old. Um, but what the Internet of Things, I think, really, it, it, it puts us kind of in between the two extremes. And I notice there on the, uh, the voting board, we've got safety and convenience. So those are really two ends of the spectrum uh, that I see. Internet of Things leans definitely more towards the convenience side. It could be a way to increase safety. It could be a way to enhance other information that the vehicle or the driver otherwise has to have. Uh, but I think for the most part, it's the, the, the idea of knowing the traffic conditions up, up the road, that's going to be a real convenience factor, not necessarily a safety factor. I'm glad you bring that up because, Andreas, you mentioned the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. Can you talk for a moment, what, what does that mean, and how is that going to change the driving experience for, for drivers and passengers alike? Happy to. Um, we Cisco invested in a company called Coda Wireless. They provide uh, the radios that have ultra low latency communication capabilities that also reaches around corners or reaches over hills. So it's the immediate, uh, I would say, uh, little bit less than a mile, sometimes a mile uh, difference, where vehicles can give you a little bit more warning to um, prevent an imminent crash. So a fast vehicle is approaching or somebody is stopping in front of you um, and, and brakes uh, uh, are very harsh, and, and you can gain, uh, I think, uh, a second or half a second more warning, which allows you to react to it uh, and prevent this crash. I, I got a little bit from the kind of the experience kind of standpoint from the... Uh, right. So just uh, for us, the, the concept of the road ahead is, is very important. So if we know, in our case now, in a navigation experience, knowing where knowing where the driver's going and be able to provide value on that route is very important. So knowing where they're going, be able to tell them traffic on that route or as they search for things on that route, it's kind of very, very, very valuable. So for us more, we're putting a lot of effort into trying to figure out where a driver's going even when they're not in a na navigation session. So maybe based on past behaviors and kind of deducting where they're going, looking at their calendar, things like that. But if you combine this with kind of the the, uh, the V2V concept, where you have maybe kind of an automated version of that, the trucker driver who's got the CB radio feeding back information from ahead. I mean, it's very valuable where cars on the road ahead of you feed back information. So road conditions, weather, traffic, there's a whole, there's a whole variety of value that can be added through, through to, from communicating back from other vehicles. And when you look at the innovation that's slated for the next 12 to 24 months when it speaks to connected car, what consumers expect to see from car makers uh, tangible advancements that make the driving experience better, safer, more convenient. What, is that, what does that look like over the next 12 to 24 months? Okay. I'm not a car maker, if you like. not a car maker, but uh, <laughs> having worked with uh, a number of car companies and suppliers as they build these new products, and they have a very sure. difficult challenge ahead of them because of the timing. Uh, you know, a car that's going to ship in 12 months from now, and, and I'm sure Tim could probably give me a little insight here, uh, is probably going to have been defined in 2012, 2011. And that's when the iPad first generation was released, and it was discontinued in 2011. So you, you have this disconnect, and it's not really because cars take too long to engineer. I certainly wouldn't want the car maker to rush in engineering a car that's going to be a safety-sensitive issue. But it's just simply because of the processes that are involved tend to uh, require a fair amount of rework. And so we've found that for the companies that are trying to reuse more of their software, they're able to do the innovation at the tail end of the cycle. Instead of having defined the usages of the cellular technology or the, the tablets that might be coming into the car back in 2011, they could be developing those and defining them 
in 2013 to ship a car to you now. So I think that's, that's a challenge that some of the car makers have really started to move forward on, but traditionally it's been really hard. Thank you. Tim, just, do you disagree? No, no, I, I, you, you bring up an interesting point in, the, in the, the notion of a car that's being developed for now, you know, that's coming out now or is coming out in 12 months. You're right, it, it was worked on some time back. We're working on cars that are gonna show up in 16, 17 uh, timeframe right now. Uh, that's just the nature of it. But I think what we've done uh, and what the industry is working to do, and I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's done. Uh, what we've begun to work, the path we've been to work, begun to work down is to build interfaces that we can then establish as kind of touch points into the vehicle ecosystem. Um, if we look at the vehicle as um, as a set of APIs, for example, right? We've we've begun to do this. And we've got a, um, in fact, we've we've begun to develop a set of re what we call remote APIs that allow us to use that built-in connectivity. And a set of APIs is kind of virtually enveloped around the vehicle that then um, service providers, app providers, or whatever can then access the vehicle. And that API uh, to find out where the vehicle is, to find some diagnostic data on the vehicle, to pull key parametric data off the vehicle, doesn't change then for the life of the car. And you can, you can really come up with some clever notions, uh, much to, to, as to what's happened in smartphones and tablets, where once you have an API that will be able to uh, give you back on a, on a tablet the location of the tablet or be able to write to a screen or access the speaker or the touch, uh, the touch interface, um, much like that, not quite as deep yet, but much like that, we've begun as an industry really to start thinking about this. And in, in our world, um, we recognize that developers are going to want to get a sneak peek at what that is. And so we've started to build APIs and build mock services behind them. Uh, we created a website, developer.gm.com. People can go and start to interface with those and just get a sense of what's available as the enablers so that, uh, again, I can't necessarily predict what that what will come out of it, but we recognize that people that are very, very clever somewhere are going to sit down and look at those and say, boy, you know, I can do this and this and this, and then combine it with some things from the cloud and bring something really rich and innovative to life that helps with the vehicle ownership experience or the driving experience uh, or some other aspect of, of the vehicle. Yeah, I think you guys are facing a tremendous challenge. Uh, you need to preempt uh, today what uh, customers will want in three years, and then the cars have a lifespan of another 10 years. So yeah, how do you keep this, uh, uh, how do you compete with devices that have a life cycle of 12 months? Uh, and, and I think this is really a struggle, and we just discussed this on the previous uh, <coughs> panel a little bit. I think eventually you will need to, um, uh, if you want to compete with uh, modern devices that, that uh, come about after you have launched the vehicle, there needs to be an openness to integrate these newer devices, higher compute power, uh, newer uh, antennas, uh, like we had GSM a couple of years ago, and now we have LTE. Yeah? Would every, anyone in this room want to go back to 2.5G? To, uh, uh, you cannot. So there needs to be some level of upgradability built into the vehicles of the future. Go ahead, John. I'm going to ask you to rephrase the question. I think the question really is, what new features and functionality are going to be in your connected car that was released 12 months ago, not 12 months into the future? And I think that's really what we're all looking for. And, and to kind of address what you're saying, Andreas, uh, you know, the reason that you can quote unquote compete a car competing with a phone. It's a ridiculous concept, but no, nowhere near the same thing. But we do tend to do that. We do tend to think of that car as a phone because we live with the phone in the car. Uh, but one of the things the phone has that the cars generally haven't had is over-the-air updates. Uh, you know, you, the gentleman that was on the stage before from Pioneer talked about their new generation of, of aftermarket radios. Now, an aftermarket radio, as I remember, is something you put in yourself after you bought the car or you have somebody put it in. So you can have the freshest version. I could have a five-year-old car like, you know, like Doug Newcomb had, or maybe it was even older than that, and, and I can get the latest and greatest radio. Well, guess what? It doesn't have the CarPlay feature in it yet. That's not coming out until March of next year or something. You want that. You want those add-ons. And I think that's really key value for the connected car. It's less about 
Oh, being able to download applications that you could have some developer write in his garage. That's not really what the connected car is going to benefit you from. It's from the ability for the car manufacturer to enhance the owner, owner's experience to make that car more attractive to you over time. And hopefully you don't get stuck with a 2.5G radio. You've got something that is, is going to last for a long time and you're going to be happy with it. This brings up a topic that I wanted to touch on as well, which is the generational elements that you're dealing with as you're marketing your products to your customers. You, I was at a panel discussion in South by Southwest, and a gentleman brought up the point that discretionary income tends to be connected mostly with the baby boomer population. <clears throat> and yet, the most tech savvy population are the millennials. And then you have Gen X in the middle. And so, how do you balance that? bringing the right level of technology and innovation to an audience that actually can afford to pay for the product. Well, what other things you do see when you, obviously when you survey those different groups, one is the younger demographic wanting to extend their existing solutions, their existing lifestyle into the car. Sure. So that, that's one element. And I, I think we're going to see a, over the next year or so, we're going to see a big change in the space in regards to connecting your smartphone to the car. I mean, obviously, CarPlay, and, and this week everybody's expecting a big announcement out of Google too. So I think that's one element, but clearly it's not one size fits all. On the other end of the scale, if you, if, you, if you look at research of a little bit of an older demographic, they typically want more of an embedded experience. They, uh, they want a little bit more turnkey. It, it's not that they don't want the technology, I think they want a little bit of a different experience. And uh, so I think that's kind of, it's definitely not a one size fits all. But it's uh, also, too, there's an element of bringing an experience that's appropriate for a vehicle. So if you think like getting into a, a Tesla, for example, anybody who's sat in the, the, the Model S, it's a, I mean, the center sack is a real big part of the overall vehicle DNA. It sets the tone for the vehicle. And, sure. and that, that also can be the same case for a, a lower end vehicle that's targeting a younger demographic also. And I would say just to build on a little bit of what you just said, Niall, the, uh, uh, when I look at the fleet of vehicles that we've been uh, putting connectivity elements into, uh, our entry-level vehicles is where we spent the most time really focusing on being able to leverage a broad-end device. Um, uh, a lot of people, when they saw the offering that we, that we put out, for example, in a Chevy Spark, which is a, a small car, um, the very first thing we did is make sure that we were able to take advantage of brought in technology and really leverage it. In fact, we don't even offer uh, an onboard nav solution on that vehicle. It's brought in with, with a device. So um, we're trying to really uh, address the markets of people that buy those vehicles. Those are, that's a millennial type of vehicle. Um, at the same time, a luxury buyer wants their attributes as well, and there's certain things that they want. So um, we don't always introduce the newest, latest technology just on a luxury car and then funnel it down to the small cars. That's a historic model mm -hmm. uh, that the car industry has followed. Um, we've actually started to introduce technology on the entry-level vehicles. In the case of like 4G LTE, we're going on everything from the Spark to an Escalade, 30-plus nameplates this year. And, and the reason we're doing that is because we recognize um, that those car buyers uh, are going to be interested in the technology regardless. That's going to have a very broad appeal, we believe, across a lot of different age groups. Yeah, to add to that, I think the, um, the idea of context and enveloping the user in the appropriate technology for them is exactly the right approach. You don't want to over-engineer a lower tier solution, especially when you have a demographic shift like the one you're seeing around millennials and the generations to follow where access versus ownership is really a prime concern. I want a car when I want a car. I don't necessarily want to pay for the car, at least not in the traditional model. So uh, OEMs are looking at those models too. How do we build cars for that instance in the same kind of modular way? How do we embed the right level of connectivity into those cars so the experience is fluid because there's an expectation of fluid experience? But it's, you don't have to over-engineer these things. You just have to plan for a longer-term cycle on them. And that's, that context is key. How do you, oh, sorry, I wanted to comment on the economics. I <clears throat> recently learned of an approach that I'm very impressed by that the car industry is leaning towards in terms of ways to lower the cost of building the car, not increase the cost, which tends to be what happens as we add technology. We've kind of all gotten accustomed that every single car, including the lowest end car that GM makes, Spark, that they have a screen in the middle between the two, the two seated in the front. And that's an expensive piece. What I see now happening is they're moving all the screen functionality in front of the driver and making that all digital cockpit. Not because it's a gee whiz, wow, what a fancy dash, but because they're going to take the screen off the middle 
and they're going to only allow the driver to see that map. Why does the passenger need to see the map anyway? So they've got a digital cockpit there, which saves money. And I think that's ultimately what's going to sell cars. Cars have to have a lot of value for the money. So if you have a, an early new driver, my daughter, 17 years old, she didn't want a big old luxury car. She wanted a small car, lightweight, easy to get around, and also inexpensive. Inexpensive is a key. And I think that's one of the things that really drives demand with smartphones. They're inexpensive. It doesn't matter how expensive the phone itself is, it's relatively cheap compared to ownership of a car. The, the key, I think, and it's just one sentence, um, the transition that is currently, that I see uh, coming uh, our way is from building cars or, and from building and selling cars to selling travel time well spent. Um, because the next generation doesn't necessarily want to own a car, cannot in many cases in the emerging world afford a car. Uh, and that's why they uh, need to share mobility and uh, the, the Internet of Everything can enable this because you connect the people that can then share uh, one vehicle. The other element of that is um, you will see vehicles where kind of we just pump our personal lives into the vehicle when we are using it and we are extracting this uh, when, we, when we leave it uh, to be used by others. Uh, we demonstrated uh, such a concept at CES. Uh, some of you may have seen it. So you kind of, uh, it's actually the digital part of the car that is your personalized uh, vehicle. Uh, it's like your stations, your settings, your everything uh, that you can then take into any type of uh, shared vehicle. Coming out of the recession, there was discussion about car owners were owning their vehicles for 10 to 11 years, uh, roughly speaking. With all the connectivity, all the technology, all the innovation going into vehicles, do you see that continuing where people will buy a vehicle and own it for 10 years? Or will it morph more toward cell phones and other mobile devices that have a much faster refreshment cycle? How, what, do you, what do you think that looks like? Well, I'll take a stab at that one. I think, I think that's possible. I think just to his point, though, uh, there's a lot more people coming into the connected environment of the Internet of Things that are less well dispositioned financially mm -hmm. than most of us. And as those people come online, their needs are differentiated, and so the technology context, again, has to be differentiated. The idea of multiple users on the same device is not uncommon in Africa and other, uh, other <laughs> nations where there are whole families using a single device, and to do multiple functions simultaneously so the context inside that, that technology has to be relevant. And at the same time, the way that that, uh, that comes to market and how it's brought into the market means that maybe you are using a, a more of a platform approach to deliver higher value across a range of vehicles. Um, obviously, Tesla's been fairly famous for this in the sense that they've got this now platform around the Model S. They want to do the Model X off of that, et cetera. So that's a good example of that. Plus, at the same time, there's no internal combustion engine so everything's based off electrics, they've already leapfrogged some technology, which I think is the other key here, is you've got, in those cases, in um, places that are more socioeconomically challenged and have not been the top tier uh, financial boon for the, any of these industries, whether it's PC or mobile, et cetera, you've seen a, a wholesale leapfrog of older technologies. So it's quite possible that we're going to do the same thing here as we go into emerging markets, that you'll have to develop a wholly new platform, technology platform, to serve those markets than the one we do in the first world. Anybody else have any comments on that? Another question that comes to mind is, with the connected car space today, what are the one, two, or three things you think need to happen to achieve the autonomous car that's being talked about by 2020? What, what, are, what, are, the, what are the things that need to take place in order to make that a reality? Joel, you want As to we work towards autonomous cars, um, there's a lot of hardware technology that's already available. So it's not hardware. In fact, I'd say the number one thing that we're going to need to deliver an autonomous car is software. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the number two thing is software. <laughs> and the number three thing is software. There is a ton of software that is in need of development, not just creating the software, but proving that it's safe. We know many, many cases now where software has been blamed for safety incidents. So there are processes now in place for automotive developers that have rigid procedures to not just uh, you know, check the software, but check the whole system 
and make sure that it was built from the ground up to be a safe mechanism. So an autonomous driving car is going to be the ultimate test of whether or not we can have functional safety in our software and in our hardware. And I, I think there's tons of work for software developers to join the automotive industry. Yeah, to add um, to that, oh, sorry, uh, add to that that the, um, this is another illustration of where the opportunity really lies for developers and third party uh, folks outside the, agent, uh, the, the core industry, maybe the adjacencies, if you will. Uh, it's about figuring out those harder, stickier problems. It's looking at where there are connectivity issues. If you've got, if you've got a need for connectivity, but you've got even a 3G or LTE at this point chip embedded in the device, over time, it's gonna, you know, that's not going to give you necessarily the throughput you need to manage some of the services you're going to need to maintain the car, et cetera. There's always going to be some, some sticking point there. But software can fix a lot of those problems, especially as you can drive more efficiencies through the software than you can through the hardware. The hardware becomes kind of fixed and the software can add layers and layers and layers of more value. So. Well, two items, one, uh, one hardware first. I think definitely sensors, we need more sensors, better sensors, more granularity around the sensor data, and, and uh, ideally opening these up to third parties where we, we have a whole new wave of innovation taking place. I mean, that's one for sure. Also one that's kind of near to our heart is a, bit, a higher, accurate, better map, a map that can power the autonomous car. And, uh, mm -hmm. We've made a lot of strides in our mapping technology over many, many years, but it's still it's still not perfect. But uh, leveraging sensor data from highly connected fleets of vehicles can really move the needle for, for the mapping space going forward. And uh, we're actually supporting an initiative around open street maps, which we think could be a de facto industry standard for auto. So it's kind of one of those items where we all contribute in, make this map a very, very powerful map that, that in the coming years could power the autonomous vehicle. I would just also add to the comments I already made. Uh, when I think about what's really going to be required, in addition to the, to the topics that are, have already been raised, we've got a, uh, a large system that has to, the, an ecosystem, if you will, that has to really be engineered well. Um, and the connectivity elements are really going to play a big part of it. And I'm not just talking about the pipe, right? It, it's one thing to say you're going to put this pipe in place and it's high bandwidth, low latency. I'm talking about the ability to leverage that pipe to deliver the services that are needed, including making it better over time, right? Over-the-air updates are going to be a key part as new software algorithms get invented, uh, new, new practices get put in place. Vehicles are going to have to behave themselves with each other. You're going to have a, a whole ecosystem out there that you're going to need to keep current and updated. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how this evolves because we collectively have the challenge of building technology uh, based on what, what came yesterday in terms of silicon and software practices and that. You can update the software practices. You've got to figure out how to overcome some of the other challenges as well. And in, in the case of autonomous, I actually would make the case for you need infrastructure. Um, because um, on one hand, you need to ask the question, we have dedicated lanes for buses. We have dedicated uh, lanes or sectors of cities for bikes or for pedestrians. Well, could we have dedicated lanes for autonomous vehicles? Could we be on the market faster if we had dedicated lanes or dedicated sectors, cities maybe even, where you only can drive autonomous vehicles? Probably yes. The other element is um, you need these highly accurate GPS systems. Now, the GPS, as we understand or have it today, is not accurate enough to define where the vehicle actually is on the road. So in this case, you also need infrastructure-based augmentation um, to, to better pinpoint where the vehicle uh, is driving. The last element of this is you want to have redundancy in your connectivity, because if connectivity is an issue, for autonomous driving, then you want to make sure that you always have a backup pipe, so to say, to get the impulses from the external world to make this car work autonomously. You mentioned infrastructure, and last fall we, our firm did a, a survey with government officials, federal, state, and local elected officials, uh, to talk about what are the priorities for them in transportation. And one of the comments that came back from all of these officials was they felt that innovation happens in a vacuum, and then it's thrust into the marketplace, and then everybody has to react to it. And one of the co comments that they brought up, a couple of uh, US senators said, we want to be part of the process as you innovate and you transform transportation. What is your opinion on that, and what level of dialogue do you think needs to take place uh, between 
private sector industry and government to achieve some of these advances that need to take place to get to the autonomous I'd part. like to just make one comment on that. <clears throat> I think what you're talking about is the public. The public right. wants to have access to the, the to the innovation. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a senator, maybe it's a congressperson, but it's uh, it's ultimately what the public owns. And what that's called in the computer field is open source software. Um, open source is a, is a methodology and it also creates a repository of software. I think Niall pointed out a good open source project, the open street maps. What a great concept. You know, everybody chips in. We all get a better map system or let's say we all get a better algorithm to detect pedestrians and then everybody gets to benefit from it. Now you'd think, well, that's going to put all the car, business, call, car companies out of business. They're just going to have the same thing, but they aren't. They have plenty of room for differentiation. You could put 95% of the solution could be built on common software that everybody uses, which is how your phones work, and then 5% difference will sell that car. And I think that's where the industry is trying to adapt to that new model. Yeah, it's going from a more competitive mindset where I have to create everything, I have to own everything. It's I'm going to absorb all the risk and I'll transfer that in, in incrementals through to the consumer. And what you're really talking about is a partnership model where we all share that risk. We go into a solutions oriented model where we're trying to solve key problems in order for everybody to move forward. And that's a very different mindset than we've seen from the auto industry in a long, long time. And those lessons are hard won. And I think that right now going forward it's across the board. and. Government has a key role in this because if they see innovation coming lightning fast out of nowhere, their reaction is to go in and regulate to protect the consumer. If the consumer and the public comes into that voicing alongside the OEMs, alongside service providers and others, you have a more holistic agreement that can be achieved. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be perfect or that people won't squabble over territory, but that there will be something more meaningful there that can be achieved because there will be a broader sense of consensus around those solutions. I want to open it up to questions that folks have for the panelists. Can you, yeah, can you identify I, yourself and then your question? That'd be great. Hi, I'm John Rich. I'm with uh, the Future Experiences Group at Moxie Interactive. And you both, uh, the panel discussed a couple of things. The idea of the car as a platform um, and it being more open source, and then the, the uh, cars being autonomous. And so I can see some of the amazing benefits of this. Obviously, I think. The vast majority of cars spend the vast majority of their time in a parking space or sitting out here on the street. So I can see a lot of those benefits. Um, but what about the disruption to the industry itself? If you only needed one car for every for 10 vehicles that existed now, how, how do you see that playing out? It's an easy answer. Each car is going to be $500,000. <laughs> so you're going to share it 10 ways, 50000 apiece. No, you, you, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. But it's not only disruptive to the car industry, because uh, the effects that you mentioned, maybe uh, less cars uh, uh, will be sold, um, is only one aspect of it. It will also be uh, impacting the insurance industry. If we take out 90% of crashes are driver error, if we take this risk out, they cannot charge you at the level they're charging you right now. Uh, at the same time, the insurance industry's uh, core business is actually investing our premiums in the financial market, and this is how they make their money. Well, if they have to reduce the fees, their fundamental business model is going to change. Uh, the other element is it's going to trigger a, um, a conversion between personal transportation and public transportation. You know? If you, a, car, a car is sitting 95% uh, of the time in the garage, if you then share this vehicle, and you get it when you need it, um, then kind of what's the role of public transportation? Yeah, maybe we see uh, uh, whatever, uh, a, a bus where those little vehicles can attach to, get recharged on the longer hauls, and, and just do the last mile uh, uh, independently. So this is also kind of the question then, who is going to own this space? Is this an auto company? Is this uh, companies that do public transportation? Or is this a new player that suddenly invests in driverless car, in car sharing, in maps, in a lot of other things that if you stitch them together, create a mobility enterprise? Other questions? Yeah, I have a question uh, okay. from Sirius XM Satellite Radio. Uh, I want to ask about smart roadways because we can't fund the highways we have now. We're about to run out of money in the highway 
trust fund, uh, who's going to pay for connected roadways? How are we going to fund that? I know in Oregon they've been looking at a, a unique model because they're trying to figure out how to replace the gas tax when the gas tax goes away. So states and municipalities are already looking at ways to find alternate streams of funding, much like the insurance example where it's a pay-per-use model that you're seeing emerge where once the risk of ownership or operation of the vehicle goes down, uh, you can find new ways to monetize yet even smaller increments. It's just a, a differentiated play. So like what Oregon's doing is they're trying to figure out if we have uh, roadways we have to maintain, and over time more and more vehicles go electric or to an alternate fuel, then we won't have that same level of tax because people won't be at the pumps. Uh, so that's a differentiated way to look at uh, how to create that just based on usage, charge people for at different tiers, much like you would for any other service, and then find ways to monetize those at an incremental level that's that's perfectly suited to that that user, that consumer, yeah. depending on level. Uh, this is a topic dear to my heart because I just paid the road tax personally uh, through uh, two air suspensions that I had to pay for uh, over the last year. And uh, if you look at the numbers, uh, if you would put a street price to the road assets, uh, paved road assets here in the United States, you would get to a value of about $27 trillion. If you then um, calculate, look at what number, uh, what do we have available to maintain these roads? What's the income? It's about $100 billion that we spend uh, on our road system. If you turn this into a return on assets, it's 0.4% return on assets. Any company in this room that would return 0.4% return on assets would be in trouble. That's one element. But you can also turn this around and can say, well, over how much time do I depreciate this? It's 250 years. We are sweating our road assets 250 years. That's why we drive over potholes, and that's why at minimum 25% of our road system is in dire need of repair. So the only way out, in my view, is that you come to more advanced uh, ways of funding this through, through smart road pricing systems that could be designed in a way that you can, on top of just fixing the roads, which is absolutely necessary, put in the necessary technology to enable a lot of these great use cases we've been talking about and testing for a long, long time. Can I just follow up if you want? I mean, do you think that we should get away from the user-based fee, and since we all benefit from good roadways and will benefit from smart roadways, that we should all be paying for roadways? You are paying for roadways. It's just indirectly. It's a Pigouvian tax, it's called. Yeah? It's like every single one in this room's pay, room uh, pays taxes, normally. Uh, some companies find ways they don't pay taxes. <laughs> but um, but, um, <laughs> but um, so, so we are paying for the road system. Yeah? You, could create the, the, you need to be, I think, thinking out of the box in the sense of, well, if you would just swap what we pay, every single one of us, through fuel tax and say it's a wash, yeah? you just don't need to pay fuel tax anymore, but instead you're paying a smart road price. It's in a complete wash for all of us. And the price is just calibrated a little bit smarter depending on supply and demand in particular road stretches. Suddenly you have a viable financing model to solve this. Andreas, what, how do you, how do you uh, it's a really interesting point, but how do you get other people to think in the way you just described? I mean, that's quite a bit different. Yeah, yeah. you create events like uh, you guys and Doug and talk about it and, and get a majority of people to buy into such, uh, no. such a concept. I, I have a better idea than that. I'm from Detroit. I think <laughs> the potholes in Detroit are worse than they are in New York City. How about an adopt a pothole program? <laughs> you sign up on your smartphone and you put in your money and everybody else puts in 50 cents and pretty soon you got a million dollars to go and fix the potholes. I think the real issue isn't so much is there money. People are used to spending money to use roads. Roads are extremely valuable. It's probably one of the number one things people would say, my taxes, I'm gladly going to pay them because I've got these roads out here. It's the issue of do they see what they're getting. There's no direct correlation to that. You can raise the taxes and still have potholes. So that's what people's perception is. I think the smart road infrastructure and the Internet of Things gives us that opportunity. You, as consumers, can cast your vote with your wallet and effectively help pay for that infrastructure. I think it's going to take some creativity. I think the buzz campaign will start at events like this, but it's going to end up somewhere out there in the Internet. Yeah. But, but one, one other point, uh, can if this is disrupting yet another industry, because the industry that is currently producing toll gates, the gantries that we drive through, 
uh, is, uh, is going to lose out because if you can suddenly do this via your phone potentially or via a device that everybody puts in his vehicle, then you don't need this very expensive infrastructure. So yet again, another industry is being affected by this, uh, this change, transformation. Any question over here? Uh, Jim Motivale, I'm with Car Talk at M NPR. I was wondering when you thought we were going to see certain elements that are common in the car now disappear. In the BMW i3, now there's no AM radio, and probably about a fourth or a fifth of the cars coming out now don't have CD players anymore. So are we going to lose terrestrial radio as well as a CD player, and when will that happen? I'll, I'll, I'll start. Tim, go ahead. Well, I, I have to admit, even though I'm a CTO at General Motors working on connectivity, I still listen to AM radio stations. Yeah, um, I, occasionally, at least, right? Um, I do listen to Sirius XM, by the way, as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so I, I think, though, the, the natural uh, evolution of media is going to continue to migrate. If you think about where we've been as an industry, you know, when eight tracks were the rage, right, 60s and 70s, and then cassettes came in, and then CDs started to infiltrate, and then we had multi-disc CD changers, uh, and then we've gone to USB ports now, and Bluetooth <coughs> interfaces, now Wi-Fi is emerging. There's a natural evolution that's happening. Um, whether that leads to complete elimination of, of certain, uh, certain things, like a AM tuner, um, you know, I think some of those have just got, they've, they've been around for so long, um, I think it's going it, to, uh, unless something can replace it in an equivalent way, it's going to be difficult to imagine um, life without a, an entire media that people are willing to consume. The reason that CDs replaced 8-tracks is because you could consume that same Beatles album on a, on a CD that you could get on an 8-track tape, right? So I think what's going to happen is there will be a continued migration of media. Um, we're seeing it transform, and I think that it's probably picking up the pace. Some of these older technologies that I talked about were around for a decade plus. Uh, some of these newer technologies were around for maybe a potentially shorter period of time. So we are still seeing an evolution. And of course, streaming um, is, is naturally coming. It's, it's, it's there with other areas, it's other devices, and I think it's going to be there with vehicles yeah, as well. I, I, Gentlemen, I just have a few seconds left, so if one of you wants yeah, to take I, a follow I, I, up. I, I, one, one, oh, sorry. I need to listen to NPR more often because I did not know that the BMW i3 did not have an AM radio. But I know that there's multiple radio options, and one of which was in our booth at CES last year, and it definitely has an AM radio. So I guess you just have to pick the right radio. And, what, and, and I, think, I think it's also a function of your industry is also transforming, and it's actually an opportunity for all of us. I love NPR. I love car talk. I love wait, wait, don't tell me. Unfortunately, it is not on when I want to listen to it. So this on-demand idea, I think, applies to a large extent also to radio systems. And then the one thing that I hate about NPR is like when they do their, their runs for collecting money. I willingly give you money, but I just want to do it with the push of a button. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I want to thank all of our panelists this afternoon. Great discussion.